So tonight we're very pleased to have Bob Drinkwater with us. Uh, Bob is a historical archaeologist. Uh, he has an MA in anthropology from UMass Amherst. Um, for decades now, he's been recording, uh, photographing, writing about 18th and early 19th century gravestones in Western Massachusetts and about some of the men who made them. Uh, more recently, he's been conducting research on the gravestones and grave sites of some of the people who have been underrepresented in the New England Gravestone Studies literature, such as African and Native Americans um, and, and others. Um, Bob is the author of a, a 2020 book, In Memory of Susan Freedom, Searching for Gravestones of African Americans in Western Massachusetts. And I think you brought some copies I did. with you. Um, so <laughs> please welcome Bob Drinkwater. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Dim the lights, please. How's that? Good. How do we know who made the gravestones in the old burying grounds here and elsewhere in western Massachusetts? Well, there are published sources that tell us who some of the men were who made the gravestones. Um, Sheldon talks about Solomon Ashley and his history of Deerfield. Uh, family histories and genealogies are another source. Occasionally, 18th and 19th century stone cutters placed ads in local newspapers, the Greenfield Gazette, the Hampshire Gazette. Probate inventories are always a good source, as are land records, which often identify the occupation of a person. And if he was a stone cutter, odds are he made gravestones. These sources tell us who the men were who made the stones, but they don't tell us who made which stones. And that's been my problem to sort out for the past 50 years or so. In some cases, it's easy. Some, some of the stones are signed. And once you've got a, st a signed stone or two, you can assume that anything that's more or less similar to it was probably made by the same person. However, many stone cutters didn't sign their work, and we need to resort to other means of identifying them. Records of payment to named individuals for gravestones are occasionally found in the following sources. Um, probate records, the accounts submitted by the administrators and executors of estates, sometimes list a payment for gravestones and actually tell you who was paid. Uh, day books, ledgers, and account books of local merchants and Tradesmen are also occasionally a good source. And every once in a while, <laughs> town meeting records will contain a record of payment for a gravestone for, say, the first minister or some other prominent individual. Now, most of the old gravestones here in Conway came from Deerfield. And I'll tell you why shortly. Um, also, quite a few came from Waitley and from Bernardston. Small numbers of stones came from more distant sources, the Quabbin area, Hatfield, Charlemont, and Coleraine. Also, the sources of a considerable number of early 19th century slate and marble stones are yet to be determined. I mean, we just don't know. We're just going to keep on trying to find out. Most of the cemeteries in Conway were in use before 1800. But the ones where you'll see most of the colonial era stones, well, late colonial and early federal period stones, are Howland, Pumpkin Hollow, and Cricket Hill. In this view of a portion of the Howland Cemetery, Late 18th and early 19th century slate headstones are interspersed with 
mid to late 19th century marble headstones and monuments. Where did they come from? Who made them? Some of them were improvised from local material by people who knew how to use a chisel but weren't actually professional stone cutters. These are two improvised markers here in Conway. One at Pumpkin Hollow, another up at Howland. Around 1760, Ebenezer Soule Sr., patriarch of a well-documented family of gravestone cutters, along with several members of his family, moved from Plimpton to what is now Barrie, Massachusetts. In the early 1770s, two of his, son, two of his sons, one named Coomer, the other named Biza, set up shop in Deerfield. Biza and Coomer's names appear on the 1772 Deerfield tax list, and there are two references to Coomer in a Deerfield merchant's account book. Following a relatively brief sojourn in Deerfield, the souls moved on, but they left a lasting legacy in Deerfield and surrounding towns. Within a few years after their departure, two Deerfield men began making gravestones modeled on the stones they had left behind. One of them was John Locke. John was born in Burlington, that's in eastern Massachusetts, near where I grew up. He probably came to Deerfield in the early 1770s married Mary Faxon of Deerfield in May 1774. He was a Revolutionary War veteran and served with the Deerfield Minutemen in late April and early May in 1775. He was a brick mason by trade, apparently a self-taught gravestone cutter who initially copied works of the souls. He was paid for gravestones. This one, for example. Can you dim the lights a bit more? That's, it's still dark. Well, sorry. Um, these are a few of John Locke's early works, both at Pumpkin Hollow. They're little stones, about so big. In an advertisement published in the Greenfield Gazette in June 1795, Locke offered to provide gravestones made from the best blue stone of the Bernardston kind. That would be slate. <laughs> and the best kind of Lanesboro white marble. This stone's in Hinsdale, New Hampshire. Locke was paid for this one. <clears throat> At the Howland Cemetery, there's a stone of almost identical design for Ruth Nims. But it appears to have been inscribed by Solomon Ashley. We'll get to that a bit later. As of January 1797, Locke and one of his sons had relocated to Westminster, Vermont. He subsequently moved to Chalkanut, Pennsylvania, and died there in 1837. His local competitor and successor was Solomon Ashley, youngest son of Reverend Jonathan Ashley, Deerfield's second minister. Unlike his older brothers, one a lawyer, another a physician, Solomon was an artisan, a potter and gravestone cutter, and never married. He was paid for gravestones. For example, this one. Ashley, like Locke, was probably self-taught and modeled much of his early work on that left behind by the souls. Ashley's imitations and Locke's imitations are similar, but it is possible to distinguish the slate work of one from the other. Marble work, however, is another matter. Ashley was paid for the stone on the left. Locke was paid for the stone on the right. 
stones are nearly identical. One's for, who's that for? Deacon, oh, Deacon Obadiah Dickinson. The other is for his second wife, Martha. I'm still trying to figure this one out. <laughs> Between 1770 and 1800, two more yet more two or more yet to be identified stone cutters made gravestones from local material in the Pelham area, and at least one of them also worked in the Goshen Cummington area during the 1780s and 90s. There are seven of their stones here in Conway. There's this one. which looks like a footstone, and almost certainly is a footstone. It's identical to one I remembered seeing in Amherst. And here's what the headstone that probably once went with Elizabeth Pulsifer's footstone probably looked like. The same group of carvers in the Pelham area, they were a bit eclectic, by the 1780s and early 90s, they had started making stones like these. The one on the left, which you may not be able to make out so well, is at Howland. The one on the right is a stone in Sunderland that's more or less the same design, except that it has the initials of the deceased above the head. They're both made of quartzite, and they're weathering away rapidly. The member of this group that went to the Goshen Cummington area worked in Goshen stone, which is a bit more durable. And there are two examples of his work here in Conway. The one on the left at Pumpkin Hollow, the one on the right at Howland. After John Locke moved to, to Vermont, Ashley continued to make stone, gravestones in Deerfield and it appears that the urn and willow motif was introduced to Western Massachusetts soon after 1800 by a few young, enterprising stone cutters from Eastern and Central Massachusetts. Following their arrival, Solomon Ashley and most of his contemporaries here in Western Massachusetts began substituting urns and willow-like vegetation for the anthropomorphic images featured on their earlier work. These are two of Ashley's interpretations of the urn and willow motif. The one on the right has been broken and put back together with strap iron. This was a, a popular practice back in the early 20th century. It's frowned upon these days. In this case, however, it seems to have worked. Why is it frowned upon? Because the iron corrodes, the bolts as they rust get bigger and bigger and eventually they shatter the stone. Now, if you have urgent questions, just pipe up, pipe up and pipe, yeah, speak up. Alpheus Longley was born in Shirley and East Central Massachusetts and moved west to the Connecticut River Valley soon after 1800. In November 1805, he placed an advertisement in the Hampshire Gazette announcing that he had begun the business of stone cutting in Hatfield and had on hand all kinds of gravestones. In January 1807, he placed another advertisement in which he announced that he continued to carry on his stone cutting business in Hatfield and had constantly on hand Berkshire marble and bluestone slate <laughs> of very excellent quality. The next year he married Lois Bardwell and he subsequently moved into the Bardwell homestead on Main Street. He later served as Hatfield's postmaster he signed several examples of his work, including this stone. There are two of his slate stones at Cricket Hill. Samuel Doherty was probably born in the Worcester area. He was a resident of Goshen when he married Anna Woods, daughter of Jonathan Woods of Belchertown, 
in May 1805, and he settled in Waitley soon afterward. He advertised his painting and stone cutting business in the Hampshire Gazette in December 1806, offering to furnish marble or slate work. He subsequently moved to Belchertown and was a resident of Belchertown by 1810. His brother-in-law, Martin Woods, assumed ownership of the Waitley shop. Doherty signed many examples of his work, including this one for Philip Smith and Waitley. Where, where, where is it signed? Where did they sign it? Right there. In this case, he initialed it, but he signed enough of them that we can be yeah. fairly sure that it's the same guy. These are a couple of examples of Doherty's early work. They're small stones for children. Both of them are up at the Howland Cemetery. There are also a couple of similar design that have been shattered, probably by falling pine branches. They're now lying on the ground. And it may be too late to try to put them back together. Martin Woods, eldest son of Jonathan Woods Jr., was still a child when his family moved to the Belchertown area. He apparently came to Waitley about 1805 and probably apprenticed with his brother-in-law, Samuel Doherty. He made slate and marble gravestones and signed several examples of his work. This one is signed very faintly in the lower right corner. With just their initials? This one, I think it actually says M. Woods Waitley. Oh. They usually signed with first initial and last name and place of business. Doherty often just used an, his initials, but sometimes included the price of the stone. <laughs> Oh, um, that one we were just looking at was in the eight to ten dollar range. That was probably before before inscription. It was just sitting out in the yard. Inscriptions were usually charged by the letter, and it could get quite pricey if you were, especially verbose. <laughs> These are a couple of stones of attributed to Martin Woods at at the Cricket Hill Cemetery. The the artwork and lettering on the stone on the left is very similar to that on the signed stone in Amherst. The stone on the right, I think, is an example of his later work. Um, the fellow who's taping this is going to make a copy of my program, and you'll be able to see the pictures much more clearly on what he produces. Martin Woods had a son, Hopkins, who followed in his father's footsteps. He worked with his father in Waitley before setting out on his own. By the early 1860s, he'd moved to Greenfield. And in 1864, he and his business partner, George W. Potter, advertised monuments and headstones made of American or Italian marble, granite, or freestone. Freestone would be probably brownstone. Available near the depot in Greenfield, about where the new train and bus station is now. He signed several examples of his work, including this one, and you can see that fairly clearly down on the, yeah. the lower right. OK. Um, he also signed the, sign on, the stone on the right. That one's in Belchertown, but the one on the left, which is very similar to it, is right here in Conway at the Howland Cemetery. Jonathan Allen was a lifelong resident of Bernardston. In seven, September 1794, he advertised gravestones executed. <laughs> that's, that, that, that surprised me. Oh, no. Gravestones executed with neatness and elegance in the Greenfield Gazette. 
much of his early work features what may have been intended as portraits of the deceased. This is a portrait of him attributed to his, who was she? Sister-in-law, Ruth Henshaw Bascom. Have any of you heard of her? They have some of her work at the um, Old Deerfield Museum. She was a local folk artist who was thought to have produced more than 1,400 portraits. Much of Jonathan Allen's early work, as I said, features what may have been portraits of the deceased. Soon after 1800, however, he began carving urns and willows. During the latter part of his career, Allen, now a gentleman farmer, public servant, and part-time stonecutter, appears to have catered to a niche market. By the mid-18-teens, many families in Bernston and surrounding towns had begun buying gravestones from Allen's more prolific neighbors, the Chapins. These are two of the stones of attributed to Allen. The one on the left is one of his most elaborately, elaborately rendered portraits, which he made fairly early in his career. The one on the right is the sort of work he was doing by the mid-18-teens when he was working more or less part-time as a stone cutter and busy with being selectman and state legislator and all sorts of other things. At least three sons of Dr. Caleb and Mary Chapin made gravestones in Bernardston during the first half of the 19th century. This stone for well, yeah, it, it was Samuel W. Chapin, Seth, and Caleb. This stone for their younger brother, Job, is probably an example of their earliest work. It took me a while to figure that out, but it's, I'm pretty sure that now. The same urn and arch appear on the stone for Christina Toby at the Howland Cemetery. There are at least 34 of the Chapin slate stones in Conway. All but one of them are at the Howland Cemetery. The Chapins operated a quarry on West Mountain and a stone sawmill on Blank Pond. They did the finished work at a shop in Bernston Center. Between 1810 and 1850, they produced many, probably hundreds, of examples of a few stock designs. They were gravestone manufacturers as much as anything. In the late 1960s, H. John Michael, a summer intern at Historic Deerfield, did a report on the Chapins and their work. And a few years later, John Wilson, who's here tonight, standing up against the door, <laughs> did an archaeological analysis of their work. These are two of the Chapin stones at the Howland Cemetery. Both are variants of their stock designs. They're somewhat atypical. Oren Bennett probably came from somewhere in eastern Massachusetts, and he no doubt received some professional training along the way. He probably arrived in Coleraine sometime prior to December 1817, when his widowed mother, Sarah, married Kingman Maxim. Oren's name first appeared in Franklin County Land Records in April of 1829 when he purchased two small parcels in Coleraine. A short time later, he married Isana Chapin of Heath. His career was brief. He died of consumption March 18, 1831, age 31. The inventory of his estate includes stonecutter's tools and a large amount of work in progress. He made gravestones from slate as well as marble. His stone for Reverend John Emerson is signed 
in the lower left corner. Here you can see the whole stone. Along with this marble stone for Reverend Emerson, there is at least one of Bennett's slate stones at the Highland Cemetery. The one on the right for Dorothy Wheelock. George W. Winslow was the eldest son of Dr. George Winslow of Coleraine. While in his mid-teens, he attended the Berkshire Medical School in Pittsfield. But in the spring of 1826, he abandoned the medical profession to become a marble dealer. He set up shop in Charlemont, where according to family genealogists, he lived with his father and pursued his avocation until 1831, when he went to Buffalo to take charge of a marble works. During the brief time that he was in Charlemont, he signed at least three examples of his work, this stone for Jane White in Heath, as well as one in Shelburne and one in Leiden. This one in Heath is, is quite a piece of work. You can't, I don't know if you can quite make it out, but there's a little hand protruding from the right side of the stone, holding that drooping bouquet of flowers. And you can see the signature fairly clearly on the, on the bottom there. At the North Shirkshire Cemetery, there are five marble stones, which David Ebbets, another summer intern at Historic Deerfield, attributed to Winslow. These are two of them. These two stones and two of the three others that Ebbets attributed to Winslow are for people who died during the first six months of 1831. Uh, that was the year that Winslow is reported to have departed for Buffalo. All five of the stones in question appear to be from the same body of work, but bear little resemblance to Winslow's signed work. I suspect that they were made by someone else yet to be identified. Mm -hmm. To sum up, a lot of stones by Solomon Ashley, most of them at the Highland Cemetery, a fair number by the Woodses, a fair number by the Chapins, also by the Howl at the Highland Cemetery. Most of the early stones are by Deerfield Carvers. Most of the later, uh, I guess mid, mid 19th century stones are by the Waitley and Berniston Carvers. There are a lot of stones that are yet to be attributed. We just don't know who made them. This is especially true for Stones in Conway from the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. Most of them are made of marble. They could have come from any number of places, from Berkshire County, from Southern Vermont, ready-made, or marble for gravestones could have been shipped to, to local carvers who did work indistinguishable from many of their contemporaries in the area. These are a couple of the yet to be identified works at the Howland Cemetery. Very nice, but weathering away quite rapidly. That, this is true of all the marble stones in New England and you might say they're endangered and they could stand to be photographed and recorded at the earliest opportunity, if that has already happened. There are also some slates and other stones that appear in cemeteries all around the area. We still have no idea who made them. Most of the gravestones illustrated in this presentation were hand-hewn from start to finish. With the advent of water-powered stone sawmills around 1800, the industrialization of the monument industry was begun and with the development of steam-powered stone working equipment and steam-powered transportation networks, the railroads, 
A few decades later, all that remained for most local gravestone cutters to do was to take orders and add inscriptions to ready-made markers and monuments made somewhere else. Oh, back. In this view of the Poland District Cemetery, you can see some mid-19th century marble stones. They're just thin slices, thin machine cut slices of marble bearing name of deceased, date of death, age of death, and little more. In this view of the Holland Cemetery, there are, there are some marble monuments of a somewhat later era, the mid to late 19th century, also probably arriving ready-made in this area and inscribed by a local monument dealer, probably someone in Greenfield, maybe someone in Charlemont. And of course today, gravestones can come ready-made from almost anywhere. This one's at the Howland Cemetery. I rather like it, and it's a reminder that we need to get out there and keep recording those, those gravestones. <laughs> now, in between, my bits of research on stone cutters have been searching for the gravestones of African Americans here in Western Massachusetts. And I kind of happened on this mission by accident as I was making the rounds of cemeteries, I kept finding stones which did not say anything about who they were for, but turned out to be for people of African descent. And I began to wonder, how many of these are out there? And I started looking a bit more carefully. And here in Conway, I found this stone for Thomas Cole, which you probably already know about. As it says on his gravestone, Thomas was of African, African descent, 22 years a slave, 58 years a freeman. In the 1850 U.S. Census, he was described as a, black, as a black farmer. He was then living with Timothy Packard, a white farmer, and his family. In the 1860 Census, Cole was described as a black farm laborer born in New York. He then owned real estate valued at $900 and personal estate valued at $300. Thomas Cole died in 1870 at age 80. At that time, he was living in a white household with Colonel Austin and Charlotte B. Rice and three others. His gravestone is very similar to the stones for the Rices, who died 10 years later and lie nearby, <clears throat> lie nearby in the same cemetery. The executor of Cole's estate, H.W. Billings Esquire of Conway, paid $27 for medical fees, a coffin, and the sexton's fee, but I found no record of payment for the gravestone. From the estate papers, we know that Thomas Cole's next of kin were a sister, Amanda Cole, and a nephew, George Cole of Albany, New York. Amanda died a week before Thomas did and was buried at Albany Rural Cemetery. There's a bit more about Thomas Cole and a lot more about other African Americans buried in Western Massachusetts in my recently published book, In Memory of Susan Freedom. I brought a few copies with me, should anyone care to purchase one, and I'll save you the trip to Amherst. I also want to put, a, put in a plug for the Association for Gravestone Studies, which some of you may know about. We still have our office on Main Street in Greenfield. I'm the chair of the Western New England chapter. We meet twice a year, once in the spring, once in the fall. We've already had our spring meeting. It was out in Lee, and I'm not sure yet where the 
where the fall meeting is going to be. If you want to be added to our mailing list, you can take one of my cards, email me, and I'll make sure that happens. That pretty much concludes what I have to say, but I just wanted to introduce these two curiosities. What you see on the left is a piece of marble that someone had engraved an alphabet on. It may have been a, a sampler that someone brought around when they were trying to drum up business. It was subsequently repurposed as a footstone for someone whose initials were JP. This is up at North Shirkshire and it's propped up behind a marble headstone. The item on the right, I'm not sure what to make of that. It's at Howland. There's this little, I think it's concrete figure nestled in what's left of a pine stump. It's not the Buddha. <laughs> I, I'm not sure what to make of it. It's probably still there. I think it's been there for some time. There are little mysteries all over the place. Thank you for your attention.